Hi there. So this video is just looking at the IUCN conservation status of different animal species. Just talking about what the IUCN is and what the point of these conservation statuses are. So the IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They are a group composed of government bodies and conservation organizations. The IUCN takes wildlife studies conducted by experts in the wild to create the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. The list is designed to be a tool to help people understand how threatened species of animals, plants, and fungi are. Basically, when you look up an animal or um, a plant or a fungi species on the list, you're able to kind of figure out, okay, how in danger is this animal of going extinct? Do I need to call somebody in my government offices to try and encourage them to help protect this animal? That's the idea behind this list. So the IUCN assigns conservation statuses to different species depending on how well their populations are doing in the wild based on research. So again, when you look on the red list, this is probably what you'll see here. Basically, this whole scale of how close they are to becoming extinct. And the large red bubble basically indicates where that particular animal is. It depends on what species you're looking at as to which category they fall into. So the categories that we'll be looking at in this video are not evaluated, data deficient, least concern, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild, and extinct. So the first one here, not evaluated or data deficient. A species is not evaluated if it has not been assessed yet by the IUCN. Basically, they haven't gotten a task force together or haven't gotten any scientists that are looking at these populations yet, but hopefully that can change in the future. A species is data deficient when there is not enough data yet to properly classify it. There may have been some studies done, but maybe not enough to really um, affirm whether or not the animal is endangered. So these are some examples of animals that fall into this category. We have things like the pink fairy armadillo that live underground, and they can be hard to track because of that. We have things like um, the Javan mouse deer, which again, hides in tall undergrowth in the forest, so it's hard to keep track of. And then even large animals like killer whales may be data deficient because they have a population that is basically worldwide, and it's very hard to track those populations and to get um, efficient records as to talking about the populations of these animals. Least concern is our next category. So a species is least concerned when the population data shows they are relatively stable. So again, these are animals that we're probably used to bumping into all the time. We think that their numbers are strong enough that there's no risk of them going extinct. We have, um, in this case, a lot of animals that actually benefit living alongside people because they might take scraps from them like rooks, blackback jackals, and raccoons. All of them kind of coexist easily with people, and that's part of the reason that they are at least concerned. Near threatened, a species is near threatened when data shows the population is stable for now, but is likely to become threatened with extinction soon. So again, the reasons can change between um, why they might be looking at being near threatened. So these are all examples of near threatened animals. White rhinos aren't quite there yet, at least this particular subspecies of white rhino, but they could become threatened with extinction because of people poaching them for their horns. Same thing with emperor penguins. Numbers look relatively good right now, but global warming could have an impact on the ice that they live on in Antarctica. Maned wolves are another one that, because they live in areas that are subject to deforestation, they're doing okay right now, but if more gets taken from that area, they may not be doing so well in the future. This next category we're kind of lumping in together, vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered, because the criteria for them are similar, but these are basically animals that it is important for us to start taking action and trying to protect them. A species is vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered if it meets criteria for being likely to go extinct. And so here are the different criteria, things like population size drops. So basically, if we've noticed that a lot of them have died off really suddenly in the populations of a certain area, there's a small area where the species lives. Maybe they only live in one little part of the world. Sometimes we talk about animals only living in a certain lake or a certain forest. So that could also be a factor here. Small population of sexually mature individuals. So maybe there's only so many animals that can help bring back the population from its brink. 
there might be a lot of young individuals, but we, we're interested in the ones that can create more offspring. Or if there are projections that the species could go extinct in 100 years or less. Again, they have to look at the population growth of a species over time, but if the numbers look like the species could go extinct in 100 years or less, that's cause enough for us to try and intervene. And then extinct in the wild is our next category. This one is kind of sad, but again, it's something that it's good that we're at least taking a stance on as far as being able to help in some way. A species is extinct in the wild if the only populations are regulated by humans in places like zoos and wildlife refuges. So it's good that they're in secure places like these that are trying to raise their numbers back up. It's just unfortunate that they don't live in the wild anymore. So the scimitar horned oryx is a good example. Um, and this is one that zoos have been doing a successful reintroduction program with, from my understanding. So again, hopefully this is a species that we see off of this listing in future um, evaluations. The Spix's macaw is another one that we look at. This is the one that the movie Rio was actually based off of. So this is a species that is extinct in the wild, but there are decent numbers under human care that we're hoping to help boost their numbers back up. And then the Pierre David's deer, this is one that was kept um, kind of in a wealthy menagerie for a while, but they became extinct in their native environment. So the ones that were in that menagerie are now all of the uh, predecessors of the current population. So again, this is another one that was a tricky situation. And then our last category, of course, is extinct. A species is extinct when studies in the wild indicate that a species has completely died out. So here are some pretty famous examples of extinction. The Tasmanian tiger or thylacine, of course, went extinct um, in Australia. The passenger pigeon, which used to actually be pretty darn established in North America. You used to see tons and tons of these in North America, but it is now extinct. And then this is a picture of Lonesome George. This was a certain species of tortoise that lived in the Galapagos. Um, but his species has now completely died out. He was the last member of that species to survive. So again, extinction, like we've talked about before, is forever, unless we get into the point where technology is starting to revive these animals. But even then, we want to do our best to try and prevent species extinction if it seems like it's happening because of us. So I hope that this video helped to show why this system is important. Again, the more that we know about whether or not an animal is at risk for becoming extinct, the more we can try to do to protect it, either through our own practices or encouraging um, local and foreign governments to help protect these species more.